All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and today we have a really exciting topic, something that we hear about pretty frequently from a marketing perspective, but also, um, you know, we see a lot on the, a, a lot of chatter around this on the Power of Us Hub and in our partner communities and from our customers as well. So today we want to talk about native versus non-native and what that means for you. My name is Ashley McAlpin. I'm our director of marketing here at Form Assembly, and I am joined today by Paul Lazatin, our partner account manager. So before we dive into native versus non-native with Salesforce and what that means, I want to talk a little bit about Form Assembly. So Form Assembly is an all-in-one web form building and data collection platform. We have a really easy to use web form builder, a robust integration to Salesforce, as well as multiple other systems that you use and love like Stripe or PayPal, uh, WordPress, Drupal, and high security and compliance standards like HIPAA compliance and PCI DSS level one certification. Um, and with these, companies are able to save time, money, and effort in their day-to-day -day processes and get the maximum benefit out of the data they collect. So with that being said, Paul, let's talk about native versus non-native Salesforce apps. Excellent. So thank you very much, Ashley, for the introduction. And uh, also thank you very much for everybody that's spending time and joining us today. And let's get right into it. So today we are going to be talking about native versus non-native. Let's talk about uh, some of the common misconceptions that we hear all the time uh, and, and that uh, people might understand or uh, think about when they hear about native versus non-native app. So some common misconceptions, uh, and what we'll do is we'll go over these. Uh, we'll go over these common misconceptions, and then in the following slides, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and unpack and explain each one, so we can dive a little bit deeper and get a better understanding of the differences between the two. So some common misconceptions that we hear all the time: uh, native apps are always going to be a more reliable choice when it comes to uptime. Uh, all native apps can more easily integrate with other native apps. Uh, thirdly, only native apps can be trusted with your data. And lastly, native apps are always the better choice. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the first myth that native apps are going to be more reliable. Native apps may share Salesforce's availability, but non-native apps can be just as reliable. And as an example of this, FormAssembly will guarantee a 99.99% SLA for our compliance cloud offering, and we do run off the exact same infrastructure uh, provider as Salesforce. Um, so myth number two, uh, it, that native apps are easier to integrate. And actually, non-native app integration abilities aren't necessarily limited. Apps like FormAssembly can send data to records uh, for any object, even custom objects or objects in all of your favorite app exchange apps. And additionally, non-native apps may have more developed integrations with other services, as Ashley had mentioned earlier. And so the third myth is that uh, native apps are going to be more secure. While it is true that data for native apps doesn't leave the Salesforce server, this doesn't mean that non-native apps are not secure or that Salesforce is the only safe place for your data. As we had discussed before, FormAssembly is going to share the same infrastructure provider and data storage location as Salesforce, meaning that we're going to be just as safe and secure as any native app that's out there. And we absolutely take pride in the fact that we are stewards of your data. Let's move on to the fourth myth, that native apps are always going to be a better choice. And what you might not know is that many highly, highly rated apps on the App Exchange are non-native, including big names like Dropbox, MailChimp, and others. Non-native doesn't necessarily mean worse, and conversely, native doesn't necessarily mean better. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. So now we've talked about kind of what's the difference between native and non-native, and what are some of those big myths that we hear a lot of times? Um, you know, admittedly from native apps who want to use that as kind of a selling point, but how do we evaluate these apps like Paul mentioned um, on the app exchange? So if we're not looking at native versus non-native, what are we looking at? So first, 
the the most important piece of advice that we can give you is read reviews. I know this is not uh, earth shattering. This is not groundbreaking. We all know that other people are our best source of truth when we're talking about new applications, especially SaaS products. Um, and we want to recommend that you look not only at the number of reviews or the overall rating. Both of those can be pretty deceptive, right? I can have a five star overall rating, but if I only have one or two reviews, does that really tell you a lot about my application? application? No. Go ahead and read all of the four, the five-star reviews. Even go ahead and read the one-star reviews. Figure out what people love about these applications before deciding what's best for you and your business. Also, we recommend exploring sites beyond the App Exchange. The App Exchange is obviously a wonderful place to grab information, but there are a lot of other review sites that you can leverage, like G2, that offer really great comparison tools, specifically when evaluating Salesforce applications. Next, explore the support offerings. So you can have the best solution or platform or product in the world, but if they don't offer the support that you're going to need for implementation, onboarding, and ongoing success, then are you really going to be successful with that platform? Um, so things that we recommend you look for, professional services. So look for a company that offers uh, additional services that often can be purchased uh, where there's a dedicated team that can help you implement, uh, set up new strategies, and really get to know and learn the product better. Look for a company with free email support. So in a lot of tech companies, especially those on the app exchange, we find that Support comes in a variety of different ways. Make sure that you're finding someone that offers free 24 seven email support and chat support as well is really important and valuable. Next, onboarding calls. So make sure that the app that you choose offers really great initial support options like onboarding calls. And then documentation and other resources. Make sure they have a knowledge base similar to FormAssembly's knowledge base uh, where you can look through thousands of different articles and learn all types of different things about our solution. Next, we wanna make sure that you ask the right security questions. We get these questions every day at FormAssembly and so we've compiled this list to help you navigate security and privacy when you're talking to third-party providers. So first, where is my data stored if not in Salesforce? What is your uptime and where can I see a history of any incidents? What certifications and what standards or frameworks do you att attest compliance to? Where are your servers located and can I meet my data residency requirements while using your platform? And finally, does your company undergo third-party audits for their application infrastructure such as yearly penetration tests? For FormAssembly, the answer to all of these is yes, and we could provide you with the documentation for each of these. Um, and feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to see these as well. So I kind of just led into this, but Paul, tell us about FormAssembly now uh, and tell us why it's such a benefit that we're non-native. Yeah, excellent. A great segue. Thanks a lot, Ashley. Um, yes, and so what we're going to talk about now is we're non-native and we're highly connected. So let's talk about what that means. We offer web to Salesforce object, uh, custom or standard, anything integration. We can create or update records in Salesforce for both standard or custom objects, and that connector is bidirectional. Because what you'll see is we're able to pre-fill forms with any record in Salesforce. We can also send attachments to Salesforce. This will work with both Salesforce Classic uh, notes and attachment and lightning files, and much, much more. Really what you can think of us is web to anything integration. Uh, we serve many different verticals and have many different use cases. As you can see here, we're, we, we serve a lot of different companies, all shapes and sizes, all industries, uh, but where we're, where we're especially strong is in uh, higher education. Uh, many universities and, and institutions will use us for their stay in touch forums and student surveys uh, and registration as examples. Uh, the healthcare space for any new patient forums, medical research forms and contact forms. Uh, uh, we offer a, uh, a very compelling nonprofit offering. They use us for uh, donation forms, event registration, and volunteer management, uh, government use cases where we'll have uh, program signups, we've got document uploads available, uh, class registrations, and then finally in the financial services and fintech space. Uh, we help our clients with their onboarding, any loan or mortgage applications we have, and this is just a small sample of the number of different ways 
ways that our clients uh, use form assembly to great effect. Uh, and if you know the proof is in the pudding, <laughs> so to speak, please do test drive us on the App Exchange. Uh, form Assembly for App Exchange will allow you to access your Form Assembly account from right within Salesforce without requiring a separate login. You also can access Form Assembly from uh, outside of Salesforce if you would like to. Uh, the tool is that flexible, uh, that powerful, and again, highly connected. And we do invite you to uh, test drive us on the App Exchange. Uh, we are very confident that we're going to be able to meet your needs. Uh, so thank you very much for the time and what we'd like to do now is field any questions that you might have all right so thanks Paul and um, if you guys have any questions if you want to throw them down into the chat we will take those now I know we ran through the presentation pretty quickly um, but I know that there might be a lot of questions about native versus non-native um, okay so I see a couple coming in um, Paul, uh, here's the first one, and I think you'd be great to answer this. So how does the Salesforce integration work? Yeah, absolutely. So hey, everybody, it's Paul. Um, yeah, so it's a uh, really seamless Salesforce uh, integration. Um, it's gone, we, we connected Salesforce uh, and actually other apps right out of the box uh, through our, our connectors. Um, and so we have a, a Salesforce connector that allows you to push data both into Salesforce, but that connector is also bi-directional. So I can actually grab any record and uh, from Salesforce and then pre-fill a form with that. Um, and then also I can push uh, any information that is that lives on a form into anywhere I want to in Salesforce. Again, it's web to any object or uh, web to any Salesforce object customer standard. Um, and so what happens is uh, we, um, we'll, we're leveraging the Salesforce a API there to, again, create and update any record um, in, in Salesforce. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay. So we've got a question from Elizabeth. Elizabeth asked, uh, what specific government agencies do you work with? So I can actually answer this question, Elizabeth. Um so I and maybe clarify in the chat if you want um, what exactly you're looking for. But right now we are PCI DSS level one certified um, and we also are HIPAA compliant in terms of what government agencies we work with. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're asking like what we are compliant with and different um, like if it's more of a compliance question or if you're asking, you know, which government agencies are customers of ours because that we have an answer to as well. Um, so if you want to clarify in the chat or we're fo we'll follow up after and make sure that gets answered for you. Um, so it looks like we've got another question coming in. Um, so. So it seems like there are pros and cons for both native and non-native. It really depends on what is in it for me. That, yeah, that's absolutely true. I think our, our point here, Thomas, is that, um, you know, a lot of the misconceptions around whether or not an app is native, um, or, or a lot, I guess a lot of the conversation around whether or not an app is native tend to be misconceptions. And those are what we were trying to address today that, you know, um, your security is not necessarily compromised. Your uh, ease of use and streamlining information into Salesforce is not compromised. Some of these things that people might think out of the box are not actually true. Um, and so that's kind of what we were uh, trying to accomplish today. Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I was going to say, I think you hit it right on the head. Um, yeah, pretty much we just wanted to address what people normally think of, you know, this is an advantage to being native, right? And so, uh, Thomas, you, you're right, you know, it really depends on your individual situation. And again, I think the only thing that I'd add to that is just drive back. Like what I'd encourage you to do is when you're doing your own due diligence is, is uh, you know, always see if you can get uh, into a trial environment. And then what I do is is for uh, what I would do is do a bake off, right? And then figure out and say, hey, you know, is this going to work for me? Let's test it with our production environment. Let's test it in our sandbox, uh, and then see if if the solution is is going to be the best solution that we're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Paul. And I think, um, and it really depends on the type of application that you're, you know, reviewing as well. Um, not all you know, tools are created equal and there are different needs for different types of tools. So I think it's important to kind of weigh, you know, what are you looking to accomplish with this tool? Is it 
only going to ever be Salesforce oriented forever? Or is there a possibility that you want to integrate with other solutions outside of Salesforce? Or, um, you know, if you, if you want to go further than Salesforce is, you know, choosing a native Salesforce solution, really the best option for you as you continue to scale. So I think those are some of the questions that you have to ask yourself and you're absolutely right. It's going to be dependent on the company and, um, your individual set of needs and as well as what type of tool you're evaluating. Yeah, great points. Awesome. So we've got uh, a few more questions that have rolled in here. Um, so let me just see. Is there an option to create two records of the same object by one form submission? That's a good question. Okay, so is there is there an option to create two records of the same object with one form submission? Um, yeah, we might have to unpack that one later so I can take a look. I, I think uh, I want to say yeah, but I think I need to understand more before I give a definite answer there. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We need to, we just need to know exactly what you're asking there, Rosie, but um, you can map one form to multiple um, Salesforce objects, if that's what you're asking. Um, and you can even map one right. form to multiple Salesforce instances uh, if you have more than one uh, instance. So I think I, I, I'm with Paul. I think the answer is going to be yes, but we need a little bit more context to your question. Yeah, because I, I don't know if she wants to create two duplicate records or, you know, but yeah. we'll what Ashley said. Yeah, yeah. Rosie, we'll definitely so. follow up with you. I've got your question here um, so we can get you more information and follow up offline. Um, okay, so we've got another one here. We use you both as pre-fill and post-fill for our scholarship awardees. When a field in Salesforce is simply a checkbox, something the true-false one-zero method does not translate through correctly in Salesforce. I'm wondering if you have technical knowledge as to why this doesn't always work. Okay, that's a good question as well. Um, it's we're gonna have to, and I've fielded a lot of questions like this before. That's gonna be um, a great question for our support team because there can be a number of different reasons for that happening. It's gonna be very specific to the way that you have your connector set up. I mean, there's just so many different uh, variables that are coming into play there. Um, and so what we could do is we could follow up with you directly um, and then I could either help or we could get you in touch with our support team. That's the other thing that Forum Assembly offers is unlimited support uh, via chat and email. And that would be a good question for them so they can look at your specific case. Anything you want to add there, Ashley? No, I think that's a good point. Um, some of these specific, like when we get really into specifics on these webinars, um, you will find that we direct you back to support. I think it's just best for, for everyone so that we, you know, without context of your specific uh, instance, we don't give you any false information. So um, we'll definitely yeah, we want to take a look follow up. Yeah, exactly. Because we need to take a look at the connector. I, I need to see how it's set up, basically. Awesome. Okay, so I'll keep moving on here. Thank you guys for these great questions. Um, okay, so can you talk about current and future roadmap um, for address validation and form assembly? Locate Smarty Streets, others. So that's a great question. I can actually take that one. Um, so right now, we don't have anything definitive on the roadmap from the product team um, about address validation, but I can definitely pass this one around. Um, let's see, Mike, I will make sure to pass this suggestion over to our support team or our product team. Um, and if you have any other suggestions like this, as you're kind of navigating, um, you know, form assembly and finding out, you know, oh, I wish that form assembly did this too. Uh, you can always go to the feedback section of our road, uh, our, of our roadmap page on the website, just formassembly.com slash roadmap. Um, and you can actually submit the feedback form there. And we, our product team looks at those every day. They come in directly to our Slack channel. We all can see them um, and we take those seriously. So that's how you can get something that might not be on the roadmap onto the roadmap. Um, so I'll definitely pass that along, but I wanna encourage you to do that as well. Uh, so moving to the next question. Um, let's see, I may have missed it, but are native apps, apps that are created by the same company and non-native are apps created by third parties? Paul, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, so um, so going back to what, so I think the question is, is are native apps created by, so sorry, can you repeat the question? Native apps are created by first party companies? Is that what the question was, Ashley? Yeah, yeah, they're wondering, I think, if 
native apps are created by the same company, so so Salesforce, and non-native are third party? Yeah, no, great question. Okay, so the difference between native and non-native is that um, native was built like on Salesforce's platform. So it could be really any company that, that's going to build that platform, right? So non-native apps like we had covered in the webinar are just going to be anything that's not built directly in, in Salesforce. So does that? I think that that should answer the question. Yeah, I think so. Um, and let us know if you want more context. But yeah, that's basically what Paul said. Is it? Um, the answer is no to your question. Yes, yeah, <laughs> uh, so <any>, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So any, all of the apps on the App Exchange. Uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say all because Salesforce does have their own apps on the App Exchange too. But most of the apps on the App Exchange are third-party applications. So they're companies that just like us are ISV partners with Salesforce. Um, and so they you know, essentially play in the Salesforce ecosystem. And so the difference between native and non-native, like Paul said, is whether or not they're built right on the Salesforce infrastructure. Um, so basically, instead of being a standalone product that can work with any CRM or can, you know, have additional integrations and things like that, they're built on Salesforce just to work within the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, so, yeah. So let's keep moving. So the next question is, I'm wondering what the difference is between FormAssembly Premier and FormAssembly for Salesforce. I know that Premier, you can use connectors. So what are what are the different use cases? Additionally, with FormAssembly for Salesforce, is it required that you purchase a license for every user or can I just pur purchase licenses for my system admins? So Paul, I think we can tag team this one a little bit. Um, so when you say form assembly for Salesforce, actually you can use our Salesforce connector on any of our plans, um, on any of our plans, but really robustly on Premier and Ups. So that would be Premier Enterprise or Compliance Cloud. Um, so we don't have a separate, you know, product just for Salesforce. Our our product works with Salesforce and our connectors work with Salesforce um, on all of our plans. It's just that the higher you go in plans, the more functionality that you get. Um, but Premier, uh, uh, Premier and Apps, so Premier or Enterprise, or if you're looking for that extra compliance level, you would want the compliance cloud. Um, but in terms of the um, licenses, Paul, do you want to answer that part? Yeah, yeah, no problem. And I'll piggyback on to what you had just said. You know, again, yeah. to underscore what Ashley was saying, our offering for Form Assembly, there's not, it's all one platform. Okay. So that's one of the, you know, really underscoring how flexible our tool is. Um, again, all, all, like she was saying, all of our plans are going to be, um, you're going to be able to use the Salesforce connector. It just depends on the depth of flexibility um, that you want, like as far as what you want to connect. Um, and so, yeah, answering the question about licenses, um, it, it's actually, uh, the year of, of unlimited for us so the way that we're priced is per um, per user license so and that's defined as anybody that needs to access forum assembly uh, the application itself whether that's to be a form builder or access the response data within the forum assembly itself Okay. You do not need to match the number of Salesforce licenses and you also don't need a license to send out a form. Um, and so that's what defines a user. Oh, the other thing that where I was going with that as well is um, our tool is really flexible in that once you purchase, it's only priced by by um, user license. You get unlimited forms per instance, and you also get unlimited responses per instance, in addition to unlimited uh, email and chat support. So I think that, that that helps, and that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and Phil, let us know if you have any other questions on that. Um, okay, so Thomas is wondering if we can give him, uh, let's see, can you give me some use cases in the public sector? Paul, you want to take that one? Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so public sector use cases, uh, I've seen um, a lot. Let me think of a couple that um, we've worked with. So uh, a lot of it is going to be um, uh, application forms. Uh, there's a couple of cities that have used us. I'm trying to think. I have a couple of partners in Australia that have used us um, for registration. Um, there is a uh, Multnomah uh, County uses us there. Um, uh, what is it? The, their water department will use us for uh, applications for uh, people that need water service uh, and support. Uh, a lot of people will um, use our forms to submit, um, not cases, but if they need like a technician to come out, um, they'll use us for, for those types of forms. Um, 
and uh, yeah, pretty much anything that you need to do as far as collecting da data, you know, we'll be able to do for you. So um, yeah, the applications and, and support and uh, service forms are, are the ones that I see commonly used. Awesome, thanks, Paul. All right, we got a few more questions here. Um, so do the forms have to live on a website? How can we display our forms to the customer to fill out? Does it have to be via community portals? Those are all great questions. Um, Paul, do you wanna tackle that one first? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so um, there's multiple ways to publish a form. Okay, again, underscoring how flexible our tool is. Literally, as soon as you build a form and as soon as you hit save, you're going to be given multiple options to publish. Uh, we can host the form for you and you can access the form via a, a link or URL. Anybody can send that out. Um, that's one way. And the second way is when you hit save, we literally will give you the HTML code to embed um, into any site that you want to. Um, we also offer publishing. If you, if you want to use REST API, uh, we give you instructions for that, and you can publish that way. Uh, and we also have a uh, WordPress, WordPress plugin, so you can publish on a WordPress site um, if you want to. As it relates to communities, when you get to our enterprise plan and above, that's where we offer respondent authentication options. So as of today, we support CAST, SAML, and LDAP, uh, but then also Salesforce communities. So anybody, so basically you can protect uh, the form from access from anybody that you don't want to have access to if you have it off, if you have respondent authentication enabled. So um, you can do that with communities and there's, there's a whole slew of things that you can do um, once you authenticate to communities as well. Um, and we can provide more information um, there. But that being said, you can both authenticate to communities and we also have a lightning component where you can actually publish the form within um, a community using the Lightning component. And uh, that all of that um, documentation and instructions are, are going to be available in our knowledge base as well. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Um, OK, so we've got another one here. Can there be two-step mapping from a form assembly form into Salesforce to avoid duplicate files being created from multiple contacts from e, from single from a single client. So I'm gonna read that again. Can there be can there be two-step mapping from a form assembly form into Salesforce to avoid duplicate files being created from multiple contacts from a single client? Okay, so I want to say yeah, um, because that is one of the things that you can do. I think I'm getting a little confused when you're saying two steps, but we do have an amazing blog that covers how to set up the connector uh, to prevent duplicates. Um, so typically when I work with like a, a, with our partners, what they'll do is they'll control duplicates when they're creating the form and using the connector. Because when you get into the connector, you can specify um, really robustly actually like what, what um, what records you want to work with using our connector and then what it'll do is it'll look for that um, and then what they also do is so they'll control um, duplicates that way but then also they have duplicate rules set up in Salesforce as well so they're essentially having they essentially have two steps to prevent duplicates but um, we can make that blog available for you where we actually have a blog that has a number of different use cases for um, how to use the Salesforce connector and one of them is how to set up the connector to prevent duplicates so happy to send that um, over as well. Awesome yeah I'll make a note of that too um, so that we do not forget. All right, let's see. There's a couple more questions that have rolled in here. Um, okay, so could you repeat the ISV section, how they create a non-native non apps for Salesforce? Um, yeah, I think you're referring to what I said here, um, where when I mentioned, you know, at all of the apps on the App Exchange are created by ISV partners. Um, so ISV partners are basically uh, companies that have partnered with Salesforce. Um, and one of the benefits of partnering with Salesforce in the ISV program, which there obviously are many, um, but one of those benefits is being available on the App Exchange. Um, the App Exchange, if you don't know this, used to be you know, just open to anyone. And they, uh, I think, Paul, what is it, two years ago, they kind of closed it down and, and limited it just to ISV um, partners or partners that were officially part of the partner program with Salesforce. Um, yep. And so 
uh, that's what I was mentioning before. So everyone on the app exchange is an ISV partner. Um, and, and so when we talk about native versus non-native, all of the apps that you see on the app exchange are either native or non-native. And so the non-native ones, yes, are created by ISV partners, just like the native ones are. Yep. Cool. Um, so let me know if that doesn't answer your question or if you need any more information on that. But Okay, so I, it looks like Ben had a follow-up to his earlier question um, that included uh, communities. He said, so to publish to community, to publish the forms on communities, do you need the enterprise plan? No, you don't. You don't need the enterprise plan to publish on communities. You can use the Lightning component with, I believe, Premier and Up, but in order to authenticate, you need enterprise. So Ben, let us know if that uh, makes sense or, you know, we'll follow up after and we can answer any additional questions that you might have on the plan types and kind of what is included in each as well. Yeah, and our documentation is really good in, in explaining the differences between the two. I mean, I'm more than happy to follow up, but with authentication, you'll, you'll also get some other um, quality of life enhancements if you want, if you are using enterprise with community. So a good example is like save and resume, right? So with Premiere, um, and a, or with, with our forms, we offer the ability to save a form and then come back later to fill it back out. But with communities, you can actually use the um, the uh, the communities authentic like when they authenticate back into communities, it'll actually bring up the form. So some of some of that stuff is available if you have enterprise. Um, it, but you can always always publish a form in a community without without needing that. <laughs> so I hope that didn't make things more confusing. But the documentation is clear. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Um, so the last question, it looks like we're coming down to the end of the questions here, um, but we do have a couple more. So one question is, what are the supported Salesforce additions? So I can go ahead and answer that. Um, so we support the group, professional, enterprise, and unlimited editions of Salesforce. Um, and force.com products. So Form Assembly also works with the nonprofit starter pack, all of the vertical cloud additions, um, such as the financial services cloud and the health cloud. So basically, um, if you're using Salesforce, we can find a use of Form Assembly. Um, let me see. So it looks like those are all the questions that have rolled in. Um, Paul, was there anything else that you wanted to mention or kind of cover off before we wrap up for the day? No, I just want to thank everybody for your time. And uh, yeah, we appreciate any opportunity and uh, looking forward to serve you moving forward. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And like we mentioned earlier, we will be sending the recording after this. Um, so if you missed a portion or you wanted to hear one of our answers again, that'll be in your inbox uh, in just a couple of days after we wrap up the recording and get together a couple of resources for you. Um, if you have any additional questions, always feel free to reach out um, and visit our website, farmassembly.com, which I'm sure you've been to because you registered for this webinar uh, and be on the lookout for our next webinars uh, coming up soon. You can always follow along on the slash webinars page of the website. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>